continue our thanks for Jesus and, and what he has done for us and what he does for us today. We just pray that we will always keep in mind that he is the peace that we can only get by following him and accepting his sacrifice. And we're so thankful that he gave his life for us and shed his blood for us and that we were taking this cup which represents that blood in the way that we believe in his side. And it's in his name we pray. Let's pray, Lord, as we come to this portion of the service where we're asked to give back, we pray that we would keep in mind that all the things that we're blessed with in this life are given to us by you, and pray that we would give with a cheerful heart at this time, and that you would be with the elders as they decide the, the best way to use these funds to spread your word throughout this area and throughout the entire world. And it's in Christ's name we pray.
Good morning. If you are a guest with us today, we're really glad that you're here. We hope you feel at home and come back anytime you can. And if you're always here, of course, we're glad you're here too. We hope that for whatever reason you're here today, that you gain something great from being gathered here with the church today. This morning we'll be continuing where we left off in the book of Romans in chapter 2. This morning we'll be starting in verse 17 of chapter 2. <clears throat> Let's read there now. Paul says, Now you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and boast in God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of little children, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. You then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who have four idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Circumcision has value if you observe the law, but if you break the law, you have become as, as though you had not been circumcised. So then, if those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you, who even though you have the written code and circumcision, are lawbreakers. A person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart, by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. I want to begin with a short lesson in Bible interpretation. The sentence. The lady hit the man with the umbrella. This can have two meanings. We can be sure that that lady hit the man. But we can't know if she hit the man with her umbrella or if she hit the man who had an umbrella without more information. For example, if we read before, there was an umbrella lying in the corner of the room and the lady hit the man with the umbrella. This now is showing that the lady used the umbrella as a weapon. Or if we read, the lady hit the man with the umbrella which he had tried to hide behind. This now indicates that the umbrella was the man's. We face a similar problem when we're reading the Bible. We can usually understand the basic message, the message of salvation, just like if the lady hit the man. But we need more information and context to go deeper. <laughs> a lot of times the context is close by. For example, by reading what comes before or after the verse or passage that we have a question about. But sometimes, like in Romans chapter 2, verses 17 through 29, the meaning may not be so clear, and genuine, spirit-filled Christians may have disagreements. In Philippians chapter 2, starting with verse 1, Paul tells us, Therefore, if any of you <clears throat> have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. <laughs> Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. Although we may have different opinions, we can still be like-minded and have the same love. The love of knowing the same love of Christ that has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And we can be one in spirit and purpose, 
in the sense that we desire to live to glorify our Lord Jesus Christ. When we differ, we must do so with humility and patience. In Philippians chapter 3, starting with verse 14, Paul says there again, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, then too, God will make clear to you. Verses 17 through 29 of Romans chapter 2 is a passage where context is everything. It's a very Jewish context, which isn't familiar to us. And it makes things more difficult for us to understand. Paul is addressing the Jew in verse 17. He's addressing the Jew who relies on his privileged position as a Jew, but fails to live up to the ethical standards that he preaches. Paul addresses the arrogance and hypocrisy of this kind of Jew, who must have been represented in Rome in some way. Let's notice that Paul is also paving the way to address the arrogance of Jesus-believing Gentiles, who believe that God had done away with his chosen people, Jews. That will be discussed later on more by Paul in chapters 9 through 11. Verses 17 through 20 tell us this. Now, now you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and boast in God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a God for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of little children, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. In verses 17 through 20 of Romans 2, Paul discusses what it means to be a good Jew. I think it's kind of like thinking about what it means to be a good friend. Loyal, dependable, and supportive in bad times as well as in good. But maybe your friend doesn't live up to those expectations. In the same way, in verses 21 through 23, Paul says, you don't practice what you preach. Verses 21 through 23 say this. You then who teach others, do you teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As a result of this, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Verse 24 says that. As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, because of these Jews that he's talking to. The name of the game is hypocrisy. But was hypocrisy just a first century Jewish problem? Most definitely not. Some people say that the church is full of hypocrites. Maybe it is. But it's also a great place to get forgiven of our hypocrisy. With that said, Jesus had a much bigger vision for the community of believers in Jesus, the church, than to, than to just be a place for recovery hypocrites. Jesus told us this in John chapter 13, starting with verse 34. He says, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. The religious man in Romans 2 doesn't have the love of God in his heart. This is because he's relying on his, on his, only on his own religion, and especially on circumcision. Verses 25 through 27 say this. Circumcision has, has value if you observe the law, but if you break the law, you have become as though you had not been circumcised. So then, if those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, 
will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you, who even though you have the written code and circumcision, are a lawbreaker. In verse 25, Paul is answering a question coming from a Jewish mindset. What about circumcision? Being circumcised in obedience to God's command to Abraham and to his descendants. In Genesis chapter 17, starting with verse 9. Then God said to Abraham, As for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, for the generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. Circumcision ensured that the Israelites would be identified as God's people, the Jews. Apparently, many Jewish people believed that those who were circumcised were, by definition, saved. That they would not be judged by God even if they broke His law. The ritual for them was enough to establish their salvation, so they thought. Paul disputes that idea. But he doesn't discard circumcision itself. He acknowledges that circumcision matters for the Israelites. It's an act of obedience in and of itself. But the whole point of circumcision is lost if a Jewish person under the law breaks God's law. Paul writes that their circumcision becomes useless. They were better off if they had never been circumcised at all. These words would have come as a shock to religious Jews who believed that they were saved through circumcision and belonging to God's chosen people. These words should challenge the attitude of anyone who thinks that religious rituals, ceremonies, or a word that we don't use in churches of Christ very much, sacraments, that they can overcome the problem that we have with sin. In verse 26, Paul goes even further with a teaching that was sure to infuriate the Jewish religious leaders. He writes that the opposite is also true. If a Gentile, an uncircumcised, non-Jewish man, adheres to the principles of the law, his lack of physical circumcision won't prevent him from being regarded by God as one who is circumcised. Paul is teaching that everything comes down to whether a person keeps God's law or not. This applies whether one is Jewish or Gentile. Later, Paul will show that nobody is able to keep the law. This means that everyone deserves God's judgment because of our sin. Salvation must be found somewhere else other than in rituals or good works. To jump ahead just a little bit, because I can't help myself, Romans chapter 3, starting in verse 22, tells us this. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. <clears throat> Paul has painted a picture here of two men. One is Jewish and circumcised and under the law of Moses. He breaks the law. The other man is a Gentile, uncircumcised, but he keeps the law of Moses. He obeys it. In what would have been a deeply offensive shock to his Jewish readers, Paul said that circumcision is of no use to the Jewish lawbreaker. Worse than that is that he suggested that lack of physical circumcision is no hindrance to the Gentile lawkeeper. The first will be regarded by God as if he were not circumcised and not Jewish. The second will be regarded as if he were circumcised and Jewish, even though he's not. In 
verse 27. Paul concludes the thought from these three verses saying that the Gentile lawkeeper will condemn the Jewish lawbreaker even though he has been given the law by God and has been circumcised with their ritual. The only difference between them is whether they kept the law or not. I want us to notice the difference here between legalism and obedience. Legalism equals to observe the law to earn God's salvation. <clears throat> Obedience equals to observe the law out of our love for God. Relying only on the ritual of circumcision, which to them equal being a Jew, for God's favor is of no use at all. In the same way, for us, being baptized, if it's, if it, unless it is mixed with our faith, it's useless. Just being baptized because you've been told that's what you must do to be a Christian is not what baptism is about. Just being baptized so you can be married to someone and be accepted by their family is not what baptism is about. Someone sprinkling water on a baby so they can enter into the faith is not what baptism is about. Baptism is about us saying, God, I need help. I can't do it alone. I know the only way I can be saved is by the blood of your son. Baptism is us calling on God for salvation. It's not about doing us doing some ritual to be saved. It's about us showing the world that we believe that Jesus came to earth to save us. That he died for our sins on the cross. That he was buried. That he rose from the dead. That he went to heaven. And that he's coming back one day to get his church. Verses 28 and 29 say this. A person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No. A person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart, by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. Paul adds another shocking statement to those in the previous verses. He pretty much said that when it comes to being judged by God, Jewishness doesn't even matter. Specifically, the ritual of circumcision, which identifies someone as part of the Jewish community. It's meaningless when not accompanied by obedience and faith. Now Paul redefines what it even means to be a Jew and to be circumcised. Paul insists that it's not about being born Jewish or even being physically circumcised. True Jewishness, Paul says, is about the state of a person's heart before God. Specifically, Paul's words here involve Judaism and are, are directed at Israel. But the broader point is meant to apply to everyone. Religious sacraments, names on a church building, the way we worship, and other forms of good works are not what save us. We must be perfect in order to avoid judgment. Since nobody can be perfect, grace becomes our only hope of redemption. In verse 29, Paul concludes this section of Scripture by defining what is required to be truly Jewish. Paul was born Jewish. He lived as a devout Pharisee and was converted to faith in Christ for his salvation. He is more than fully qualified to address this issue. Paul said in verse 28 that true Jewishness is not about mere birth and circumcision. Paul states that true Jewishness, to be included in the people of God, happens inwardly. True circumcision is about the sincere heart of a person. That circumcision is by the Holy Spirit, not by keeping some law. True Jewishness, or being God's people, is about what happens inside a person, and not just about being born an Israelite and being circumcised. Paul insists that Jewishness must be sincere from the inside out. Labels and behaviors are not what matter. It is faith which identifies us as true believers. When it's sincere, when a person is circumcised in their heart and set apart with God's people, 
that person is praised by God. After all, God knows our hearts. Otherwise, this person receives praise only from men who see the outside actions of a person. And he may or may not be sincere. The praise of men is far less valuable than to be praised by God, who truly knows us. This morning, are you a child of God? Have you been declared righteous and justified in the eyes of God? Remember that justified means just if I've never sinned. Don't depend on your own righteousness and works to be saved. They're worthless, and they won't get us anywhere with God. You're a sinner, and there's only one way to take care of it, and that's by your faith in the gospel and what Jesus did for us. The Bible tells us that we're all sinners in Romans 3.23, and because of that sin, we're separated from God. Because God cannot have any part of our sin or, or any sin. The Bible tells us in Isaiah 59 and verse 2 that our iniquities or our sins separate us from God. When you believe who Jesus said he was, that he died for us, you need to make a change in your life. And that's called repentance. Jesus tells us in Luke 13 and verse 3 that if we don't repent or decide that we're going to turn away from our old ways, we will die in our sins. Matthew 10, 32 tells us that we must confess that Jesus is who he said he was. We must tell others that he is the Son of God. We must allow ourselves to be baptized, showing the world that we believe in Jesus. <clears throat> showing the world that we're a follower of Jesus. We must submit to Jesus for him to take care of our sin problem. My favorite place that shows this it's Romans chapter 6, starting with verse 1. Paul says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body of sin, the body ruled by sin, might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Are you walking in this newness of life? It says if we have been united with him in a death like this, which is baptism, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Baptism is us reenacting the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. We die to ourselves through the old way of living. We're buried in water, just as he was buried in the tomb, and we're raised to walk in the newness of life. Give your life to Jesus today. If you are a Christian, but you haven't lived a life that you should have been living, or you haven't been growing in Christ the way you should, make a change today. Keep your love for Jesus strong. There's a lot of people here that would be willing to help you in your journey. Remember that we love you, and God loves you. Remember that no matter where you are, or where you've been, Jesus can help you begin again. If we can help you with anything this morning, please come to the front and let us know what we can do while we stand and while we sing.